I have a, a comment and perhaps a question about the ticks. Uh, you know, we spend so much time trying to make new vaccines that are going to make big pharma rich. Uh, but the Lyme disease is such a grave concern. And now this other Lone Star tick. Uh, and the answer on Long Island to these things, is, you know, it seems to be vector control and, and just destroying the beneficial insects with pesticides. And so if, is, can you speak to solutions that are beneficial for beneficial insects or bringing in beneficial insects and bats and things like that um, for mosquitoes? You're basically getting at the um, central problem here of how do we control, how do we control ticks and prevent them from giving us diseases. And we haven't done a very good job uh, on that. Um, you can just see year to year to year the case numbers going up. And we've been telling people to tuck their pants into their socks and wear light clothing and put their clothes in the dryer and so on and so forth um, after being outside and check yourself and, you know, to little effect. Um, so what can we do? Um, as far as a vaccine goes, there is one in development. I'm not a big fan of a Lyme disease vaccine because... Neither am um, I. <laughs> the, well, beyond, you know, the fact that it might not be very effective, um, that it might have some side effects, and the last one did have some side effects, um, we can't become complacent about ticks because it's not just Lyme disease. Um, there are other things carried by ticks that are very serious and that are growing. If we eliminate one pathogen from the menu of, you know, what's going to hurt us, um, something else um, will come along to take its place. Um, there's so something called an anti-tick vaccine that's also in development. I think that would be a pretty good preventative. It doesn't deal with what you're getting at, and that is the environmental problem of having so many ticks. Um, you know, we can do things like um, treat mice. <laughs> there is an experiment going on in Dutchess County in New York um, in which bait stations for mice are put out. The mouse goes into a little box, gets a tasty treat, and gets doused with a little bit of fipronil. It's uh, an insecticide. It kills the ticks on the mouse and hence kind of breaks the cycle at that level because the mouse is the single biggest reservoir of Lyme disease in the environment. It is what um, most frequently infects that baby tick that goes on to um, morph into a, to molt into a, a nymph and then bites us. Um, so, you know, that's one kind of way in which we could attack the problem. Um, killing ticks is a very, very challenging um, problem, and we haven't figured out how to do it. Do it. We um, know how to control mosquitoes because they're easy to find. They're just in the air, and we do use chemical controls for them. Ticks aren't so easy to get at. Um, they're in our backyards, they're under the leaf litter, litter. they're, you know, um, out of sight, basically, uh, in places where we can't really reach them. So there is research going on as to what we can do um, to uh, limit our risk, um, but we have a lot more work to do. And, you know, we really need to, co to protect our children. Children are the most frequently bitten. Uh, population, children from five to um, nine years old, boys from five to nine are number one, and then an overall children from five to 14. A lot of them miss, you know, months, years of school as a result of a tick bite. Um, so there ought to be plenty incentive for us to do something about this, uh, to invest the money, and we haven't yet done that. So Jamal, thank you for coming back. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. <clears throat> so I think that um, that there's a part of the problem with complacency about uh, climate change 
I think, is that we really don't fully understand the implications of what's happening. So like even, you know, I know something about the environment, but even when you're talking about, so you talked about tonight, right, that the permafrost is, you know, is melting, right? That, um, that all this methane gas under the ocean that's coming to the surface. You talked about the Great Barrier Reefs that are going away and 50% of certain parts of the oceans that are, are warming, right? But can you then say to us, like what I'd like to hear and to have on video, is, okay, if the permafrost then goes away, what then happens? If this methane comes up, what then happens? If, you know, the Great Barrier Reef goes away, what then? And then if that happens, what then? And if that happens, what then? And then what happens? Because I don't think people really understand that. So when you say, oh, you know, the, the permafrost is almost gone or there's so much gone, we don't go, all right, so I got, I got 100 years, what's the big deal? No, no, we need to know if you can tell us what is the big deal. It's a good question and it's a challenging question. Um, I, I think rather than trying to answer it by projecting into the future of what happens when these different systems fail or do the things, some of them you just described, um, maybe our problem is a lack of imagination in that, well, let me preface it by saying I feel very lucky and fortunate. It's easy for me to feel the crisis in the immediate sense, in the present tense, is because I've been to it. You know, I've been to the Great Barrier Reef on top of white coral as far as you can see. I've been in Alaska in places where I used to climb across glaciers that no longer exist. Um, I've been in the indigenous communities in certain areas that are having to relocate and watching their fishing and subsistence lifestyles vanish before their eyes. And, I've been with them when they've cried. You know, I, I, I've been to these places in southern Louisiana where people are having to leave because of sea level rise. So I've had the privilege and honor of being there. So I understand, it's in me, I get it. And so, but people that haven't had that experience, I think maybe it's just a failure of our collective imagination and empathy with fellow human beings to just understand, like to see the news and be, like, well, if I lived in Paradise, California, is what, 89 people died in that fire. Um, most of entire, some entire families perished and everything that they owned. Um, just to pause and think for just a, a minute that that could happen any time now. Like, we could have a drought here this coming summer that could bring that kind of hell. Um, we could have a superstorm at the end of this coming summer that could make everything that's come before it pale by comparison, um, that it's, it's that failure of imagination, I think, to put ourselves in the places of these people in Australia. You know, I have friends over there that I communicate with. Is your farm still there? Are you st and your family still okay? You know, so um, I don't know. I mean, I think I'm floundering a bit with the question because I've, I've done everything I can to try to bring it home to people. That's why I wrote this book. Um, by going to these places and writing about it in a really, really personal way and try to bring that experience to people. Because I understand that that's a big part of the problem, especially in the United States where, you know, here we are, we have full electricity, we have climate control, we, most of us are fed and watered decent enough on a daily basis. You know, so in that sense, all of us right here, right now are in this bubble. And most of the rest of the world already is not living this way. Most of the rest of the world, you know, I mean, we, we are looking at a refugee crisis from sea level rise alone that the UN warns is going to be 2 billion people by 2100. Um, we're looking at a, a, I mentioned it this morning, one study in the last year showed that half of India probably won't have drinking water by 2030. I mean, another way to put that, that's one-tenth of the entire global population. Um, we already look at places, you know, if you're a farmer in the Midwest that we mentioned earlier, and you've had drought, flood, drought, flood, drought, flood, and you're not making it, and you've just committed suicide. And, you know, like, where's the failure in my own imagination of not being able to read these reports 
and really stopping and pausing long enough to take that in and think about that person's family. How bad does it have to be for that, per that farmer to kill themselves? You know, that that's already here, you know. And so, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I really struggle regularly to try to bring that home in a very, very real way. Um, you know, I've, I've been in my house up there a couple of summers ago engulfed in wildfire smoke, not even from fires on the Olympic Peninsula where I live, but from British Columbia and Montana. We've had wildfire smoke from L.A. come all the way up to the Pacific Northwest. And you sit there and you can't leave and there's nowhere to go, and then that's when it really sinks in. Like, oh, it's everywhere up here. There's nowhere for me to go, like this is it. You know, and that's when it really sinks in to me. And I wish everyone, anyone who hasn't experienced it in a very personal, visceral way like that, you know, but then the question is, you know, hopefully we can do that and then still come out the other side of it because daily people aren't. I mean, one statistic I shared this morning is every minute, Two people, um, no, it's every two minutes, one person is a new climate refugee somewhere on the planet. So it's a failure of imagination for me to not really take that in and know that I could be next. You know? I know that's not necessarily a complete or direct answer, but it's the best I got right now. What kind of job is the media doing in terms of covering this? You mentioned South Florida being underwater. What, uh, my um, sister and brother-in-law live there in South Florida, and they're not terribly concerned about it. Um, is it being covered regularly down there? For the most part, no. And yet at the same time, and this is the schizophrenic situation, at the same time, there's certain regional banks in South Florida that will no longer issue 30-year mortgages. So that will be another weird iteration of how finances dictate behavior and change. And why some rich people living right on the coast in that high dollar property are starting to move into other places in Miami that used to be completely unappealing to them, but now they're at 15 feet. So those property values are starting to go through the roof. I mean, there's going to be you know, financial incentive driving things, um, just like in the food sector. You know, if, if, if we can, when people understand the real costs of things, then they're going to start behaving differently. And ultimately, you know, that's another thing now is like, right, we're, we're still in this time period, a lot of us, where we can still make choices about what to do and what not to do. And this is a grace period, you know, and, and we'll get to a point where we don't have choices. So what we do now determines how hard that transition is going to be.